All right, so that's uh, this week's video about thunderstorms of different types. Um, Billy, you still with us? Yes, I am. All right, Billy, what's your what's your favorite type of thunderstorm? Uh, no doubt the supercell. <laughs> uh, the supercell is one of them things. Uh, as a photographer and uh, and just as a chaser in general, learning the dynamics of what a supercell can and can't do is just pretty amazing. Watching a cumulus cloud within 45 minutes go from a cumulus to a full-blown supercell produ producing a tornado is just absolutely incredible. Um, not saying uh, the tornadoes that cause damage are beautiful, but the ones that are photogenic and that don't hurt anybody and that stays to trees and rural areas is just outstanding. Um, you can really get up there and really study what's going on with, you know, lingering boundaries, you know, where everything's going to be sitting, where there's a low, where's the fronts, you know, and then you got those lingering boundaries that produce, you know, thunderstorms and people forget about them. And they produce sometimes the most photogenic tornadoes. And those supercells that come with those before those tornadoes are just mind boggling. Um, this year, it's just seemed like supercell after supercell. Like I've photographed at least a dozen so far, and they never get old. <clears throat> I could not right. hear you there, John. Sorry, my bad. I forget I pushed the button. <laughs> All right, so Donna, do you have any preference on your side? Uh, well, you know, as far as uh, cloud formations, I think the mammoths are probably my favorite as far as uh, cloud formations. Obviously, that just kind of gives me an idea of what type of storms we do have coming in um, and the instability in the atmosphere. Uh, and, and that I can look for, you know, a supercell at, at some point in that area. Uh, you know, I'm not much of a photographer, so I don't really get to uh, to get out and chase and, and take the, the photos that I would, you know, really like to do. But um, I think that, uh, you know, just, it is, I agree with Billy that, you know, some of those, they're just amazing. It's completely amazing on how they, uh, how they form and the structure and their tops and what causes them and um, you know, in the just the dynamics of what it takes to to create such a, a violent storm. All righty. Um, so I asked Donna to do a little special um, for her for this video. So I'm going to turn it over to her, and we'll let her do her talk. Okay. Well, uh, tonight we're going to talk about floods. In light of all the rain and stuff that we've had, we're going to learn maybe something you didn't know. Um, one thing is nobody, nobody anywhere in any 50, any of the 50 states or anything is safe from flooding. Um, everybody is subject to regular flooding or in flash flooding and um, they do, you know, more deaths are caused by that uh, than any, any other type of um, weather event. Um, a flash flood can bring a wall of water um, 10 to 20 foot high, which most people would think, well, that's, you know, the tsunami. And that's kind of what it is. It's uh, going to be a huge wall of water and, you know, there won't be any escape. Um, most of you probably know that um, a car can be taken away in as little as two feet of water. And it can be a Prius or it can also be the big four wheel drive truck that you think that's going to make it through that water. Um, nature doesn't care. They don't specify. Um, you know, if you're ever caught in a flash flood situation or, you know, impending flash flood and you have nowhere else to go, just try to get on the highest level of, of the facility that you're in. Um, and, you know, and contact emergency personnel to get some rescue. Uh, if you ever come in contact with floodwaters, you know, with your skin and stuff, try to get it washed off immediately because you don't know what type of uh, germs and bacteria and things like that that could be, you know, 
uh, you know, if you're close to Arkansas, we've, they've got the chicken farms and there can be all kinds of bacteria that gets, you know, into the water, um, especially if a farm gets flooded, um, you know, all types of waste um, that can get in, in into the flood water and you just don't want it on your skin. Um, floods are caused not only by just heavy rains, but sometimes melting snow, ice, uh, even mudslides can cause a flood because they will block off uh, main waterways. Um, floods are the most widespread natural disaster. They are, um, aside from wildfires, they are the, the most widespread natural disaster. Um, if you need to prepare for a flood, you need to have three gallons of water per person for three days. If you, you know, if you live in an area that you think, like Sperry used to become an island. Um, I've seen the waters up in Bartlesville and, um, you know, it, it, well, we all know, you know, how it can get, especially if you live in a flood, flood prone area, you're used to it. Um, stuck up on first aid items, non-perishable foods, um, and make sure you have that battery operated radio. And you also, um, and this is for any type of disaster, uh, pre, pre disaster preparation, you're going to want to uh, get your phone, take video of everything in your house, you know, everything, pictures and furniture and your electronics and things, if you have antiques, anything like that, and then upload them to Google or wherever you keep all your your photos online that you know that way if your phone gets lost or whatever you can still access it from from something else um you know for insurance purposes that's going to save you a lot of time um and do the same with your car you know take a video of your car or you know pictures of it or whatever to show that it was in good condition you know before and you know a disaster happened or whatever so the insurance company can see that um Flood damages to a home, 12 inches of water, so a foot of water inside of a 2,000 square foot home can cause over $70,000 in damage. Um, and that's a lot of money, especially if you have to pay out of pocket because a lot of insurance companies don't automatically put flood insurance on your uh, homes. So if you live in a floodplain, you need to know, you know what floodplain you live in and figure out if you need to get flood insurance, you know, as an extra to your policy. Um, obviously, if you live in low-lying areas and things, you you know, and you've lived there for a while, you're gonna you're gonna be used to it. But just don't take risks. Don't go around barriers. Don't just don't be dumb. You know, um, it, it's not worth it. It's not worth getting through. I understand trying to get out, but if you, you know, if the rains are coming and you're used to it and you're like, oh, well, I know it's going to get here or whatever. You never know, though. You never know upstream what if a levee's going to burst or something like that. So you never know. So getting out as early as you possibly can is the best option also, always. Um, you know, if anybody has any questions about that, they're free to ask. Um, but uh, yeah, just you know, our our main idea is to is to keep people safe. And since they've let the, they're letting the water out of um, you know the dams, they've opened up you know Gibson, they've opened up Caw, they've opened up uh, the Arkansas and uh, or Keystone, and um, so there's going to be a, quite a bit of water flowing. Um, so if you're you know if you're going down and you're used to fishing and things, and I don't know about Ulaga, but they may have opened that one up as well. Uh, and Copan, if, uh, but, you know, you might have a usual fishing spot that you could be sitting at, and they could open that dam, and you don't even know, and it can take less than five minutes for you to be completely submerged, so, you know, when they're, when the weather's like this, and the risk is there, I just don't, just don't risk it. Okay, and also, also, um, you want to make sure you stock up on any medications or stuff like that that you might have. Correct. Those medications have come in handy. Yeah. You know, the, uh, 
you know, two years ago, we actually lost our house in a flood, in the Neosho, Missouri flood. And uh, we had $78,000 in damages, almost four and a half foot of water in the house. We actually had to evacuate and get on the roof. I had to wait up into my neck to uh, go get a ladder to get to the roof. I mean, it was crazy. You remember that, John? Yeah, I do. I do. Dude, that was the scariest moment of my life. First time I've ever panicked. And I've chased these storms for years. Never scared me, but man, that was one time I got scared. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. Ex I didn't expect that. Whenever I saw that on Facebook from you. <clears throat> All right. So. Now, fortunately, the the engineers in Tulsa have uh, upgraded the drainage systems. Um, I was around back in 1984 uh, when Tulsa when flooded. Um, yeah. Young grasshopper. <laughs> and uh, it, it, was, it was Memorial Weekend, 1984. We only had 20% chance of rain. And it was the worst flood to hit Tulsa. And then it hit again in 1986. Um, and I lived out on Riverside and the, it came over the banks and went all the way down to Peoria. Um, it was pretty bad and it was pretty scary. Uh, water, water is very scary, and you you have no control over it. You know, um, tornadoes you can run, you can take shelter. Um, fires, obviously, you can try to get out of the way or just stay away from it or whatever. Um, you know, just regular thunderstorms. There's all types of precautions and things that you can do, but floodwaters, they are relentless and definitely the most dangerous and just don't ever you know like i said don't ever drive around barriers don't ever do anything don't think that you know more than than the people trying to protect you um Maybe because that. That, those are the people that always get hurt or killed or drown and and it's no reason there's no absolutely there's no reason there's no place that you absolutely have to be that can't wait it can't wait you know if you have to get to work well then you just call your boss and say you know what it's flooded and i'm not driving in so that's just how it is um and see that's the thing is like you said you know stay put and that's that's sometimes the best thing is stay put if you need to get on a higher ground get on your roof you know, get some more higher and like when i got on the roof i was literally screaming because people were trying to drive into this thing and i said guys get in your house get up to your roofs you know and uh, the night before, I was actually documenting flooding all, all night. And then I didn't get to bed till about 5.30 and then woke up at 7.30 with people, hey, it's here, it's here. And I'm like, what are you talking about? There's nothing, there's no severe weather. And I look out my window and it's all underwater. Within me waking up 15 minutes later, we started having water come in the house. And that, that it really puts a perspective to things. You know, like Donna was saying, you've got to be prepared for this stuff. It changes so rapidly within, within uh, with us taking shelter on the roof within 30 minutes, uh, we got on the rescue boats and then within 45 more minutes after that and got out of there, we was able to come back home. The water already receded that fast, bam, within an hour. It's crazy. And then when that water recedes, it goes someplace else. So, yes. you know, it's going down the drain. Yep, exactly. So More people are affected, affected by it. Right. Exactly. And when they say water is, uh, you know, starting to crest, that means it's reaching its highest point. Until then, it's still going to rise and rise and rise. And sometimes we may not know for two or three days how long it's going to last. So. <clears throat> All right. So here's just a little bit of a video about um, what they were talking about on the heavy rain. Um, don't drive through moving or standing water um, Reason why is because even if you drove in that road 300 times um, When it's flooded This time could be the time that it's gotten washed out or something like that uh, Six minute it only takes six inches of flowing water to sweep you off your feet and If you can't see the road turn around don't drown um, Do not go around the barricades um, whenever no water was having their flooding um, a couple weeks ago, I've seen numerous people go around the barricades. Um, so I don't don't know why, but they insist on doing it. Uh, like Donna and said, I don't know if it is 
I don't know how it is in Oklahoma or not, but in Missouri, if you get caught going around those barricades, they're going to give you a hefty fine if they catch you. Yeah, Oklahoma's the same way. So Good deal. All right, so anyways, we'll go ahead and go to our special guest, Billy. Um, Howdy, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> he's one of our newest uh, members of the team. How long have you been chasing for, Billy? I've been chasing 10 years now. I'm old. <laughs> I won't even say how long I've been, um, <laughs> but um, I kind of put a little bit of a um, presentation of some of his photos that he's shot over the last several years, and I believe Billy will be able to see it. You see that, Billy? Oh yes, yes. Uh, that was actually just a couple weeks ago. Okay, so um, I'm gonna, I got 22 <laughs> of them, so try to keep it a little bit short. But we'll kind of let you explain each picture as we go along here. This was actually after some storms came through the area and the contrast with the clouds, with the sun setting, and you're starting to get a good glow. It looks phenomenal. So we had to stop here and I had to step out and run up to this place and get a couple shots. It was actually fenced, so I couldn't, you know, get through the fence. So I had to shoot back behind the fence. So I got low and shot this. And this thing was phenomenal. Just that. The glow of that was amazing. It was uh, right before dark. This was in Shreveport, Louisiana. I was chasing a moderate risk. Uh, we ended up chasing tornadoes and fog, so we didn't really get tornadoes because we couldn't see it. We went back to Shreveport to meet up with some friends, and this happened right down the road. So we went out and filmed a car crash. It was two-vehicle accident. Um, and also, this is another thing I do do. I cover breaking news events, fires, um, wildfires, structure fires, car fires, shootings, stabbings, domestics, car crashes, anything that's uh, going to tell a story, I'll get out there and film it and photograph it. So, And this was from Shreveport, Louisiana about three or four weeks ago. Wait, maybe five weeks ago now. Maybe a little bit longer. I'll have to go look. Um, a hobby of mine when I'm out chasing is to document historical places. Um, I love documenting abandoned places and especially old schools. They tell a history of a town. They tell a history of a community. This was an old school that was converted over to a restaurant. And if you look right at the very uh, left side, you can see a uh, uh, where they used to tie their horses to. So that thing was still there. Just phenomenally amazing. And uh, just being able to tell a piece of history and preserving our history as well is just, to me, is amazing. So... <clears throat> ah man that was a i know you guys probably remember this this was part of the ray wildfire last year um this was a house that we came across just minutes after the fire kept going i should say minutes it was probably a couple hours after the fire went through burned up all these people's vehicles they burnt and burnt their home burnt their mobile home burnt their trailers i mean it burnt everything and this was their vehicles one of the craziest events i've ever seen in my life and that was the Ray Wildfire last year. These were two of the, some of the most highest rankest, I should say, uh, fire. They were the uh, state fire marshals. And uh, part of telling a story when you're out there photographing a fire, you need to show the people involved. And these two men were amazing. The one on the right is actually retiring, I think, after this year. And the one on the left has got a couple more years. But this, the guy on the right has been with the force for like, Man, I want to say at least 20 years. He's been there for a very, very long time. And he said this was actually the worst wildfire he has ever seen. The thing ended up lasting over, uh, I want to say it lasted almost a week and a half. Did you get out there, John, on that? No, I was too busy with some other things going on around here because we had some fires too. That's what I thought. I couldn't remember if you went out or not, though. <clears throat> uh, there's some more of the Ray Wildfire. They, uh, it was actually this fire, if you watch it where it's moving, where it got close to the road was a guy's home. And I don't know if you're going to show this photo or not, but there's actually a truck coming out of the, 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 the flames and stuff. And he actually ended up living, but, uh, his daughter's house and his house got lost. This, it actually was hitting some cedar trees and the cedar trees were exploding. When the fires would hit it, they would explode like bombs. Absolutely insanity out there. And that was part of the Ray Fire as well. Uh, this is in Stillwater, Oklahoma. This is called uh, Theta, Theta or Thada. 
I think it's Theta Park. It's actually at the OSU campus. Just a phenomenal, beautiful place. Um, highly recommend it. Come to town and check it out. It's beautiful here in Stillwater. This is more of the Ray Wildfire, and there's actually a store to tell with this. If you look to the left-hand side, the this, this trees are almost all gone, all burnt. The ones on the right are still there, and it just goes to show you how fire can be destructive, and it kind of goes wherever the wind carries it. So if the wind changes, it's going to go a different way. You know, it's going to go with that wind. So um, also fires generate their own wind. Um, it's just crazy when you're out there documenting these things. But that's a huge story right there in that photo. This was actually a couple weeks ago here in western Oklahoma. We were actually heading to a chase in Kansas, and we stumbled across this place. We got out, stretched our legs, and I was like, man, I got to shoot this place. This place is absolutely gorgeous. It was an old schoolhouse or it was an old uh, church. Couldn't tell which one, but I think it was an old schoolhouse and it was converted to a church. A lot of that happens back in the day. So, Or sometimes they use the same building. Beautiful, beautiful places, though. Oh, man, this is a classic. This was the Baxter Springs and Quapaw Tornado. Um, when the Mayflower Tornado was happening back in 2014, me and Eric Brown was down there on the high risk, bagging that tornado up. was coming down the valley. We got the tornado, and then we heard, you know, Joplin got hit. And I was like, no way. We got to go home if that's the truth. And uh, we get back. The next day, we woke up and had to go check in to Baxter, get some uh, documents and stuff like that, saying we could go out and film this. And this was the Quapaw sign. It's no longer there, but it was welcoming you into Quapaw, and it was twisted and bent all to shape. Oh, go ahead. Sorry about that. This was some double bolts, CGs, which is cloud to ground lightning. And this was a beautiful LP supercell right at sunset. Um, they It actually produced some of the most amazing mammatus in the world I've ever seen. Um, and this spit out so much lightning as it got to dark. It was actually, the storm was collapsing and dying. And usually on their dying stage, they start to weaken and then they start you know, just flat out pooping out and they become super photogenic with lightning. And also when storms get stronger, they increase in lightning. So when they increase with lightning, it means that they're dying or if they're getting stronger. So <clears throat> this was more of the Baxter tornado. These images to me speak a lot of things that we need to really pay attention to um, with which structures and how they stand. And as you can tell here, this was an EF2 tornado, but look what it did to these homes. I mean, just flat out, just flattened them. Yeah, a couple walls are standing, things like that. And if you look towards the window, the very, if you look straight ahead and you see where that broken glass is, there was a family that was over to the left where that frame is. That's where they were actually taking shelter in that frame. And they lived, not a scratch one. More of that storm that was dying. This was the LP supercell. You can kind of see the updraft on the right-hand side. Um, you can kind of see a little bit of a striation in the middle of the shot. And this thing, this was a single shot. So it was a, uh, it was, I think it was a five-second exposure because it was still light outside. Um, but I had to put my f-stop really high so it wouldn't overexpose. Um, one of the coolest CG strikes ever. I wish I would have got this in slow-mo. Night skies are lovely. Um, they tell a story too. The night sky is just beautiful. This place is actually not too far from my hometown in Neosho. Um, the rural areas, man, there's there's just nothing better than being out there under the stars with abandoned structures or barns. You know, I think it tells us a more of a surreal story when you shoot them at night. Ah, one of my this was the most most current chase. This was the fifth. Just, what, seven days ago? Seven, eight days ago? Something like that now? Wait, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yeah, seven days ago. Uh, Tulia, Texas. This was the multi-vortex wedge tornado. Um, one of the most insane motions I've ever seen on a storm. If you look towards the stop, that was your mezzo, where it kind of looks more white. That's your mezzo on top of your RFD being wrapped all the way around. And then if you look on the right-hand side, you can see kind of like a, it looks like a little tube going into the 
where the wedge tornado is, that's actually your RFD being pulled into that storm. And man, it's just that structure was, oh my God. <laughs> This was after the storm kind of lined out and started weakening. It was the same Tulia, Texas, but this was near McLean. We followed it all the way back almost to pretty much Oklahoma line and Texas line <clears throat> on 40 there. And uh, this was after it lined out. Still was tornado warned, but as you can see, still had a healthy core where if you look where the, uh, oh, the water irrigation systems follow that all the way down and you see where it starts to green up, that's your, actually your hair core hell core and you could actually tell there was some still decent hell falling and then you could kind of see where it kind of was lit up by the lightning which was really pretty and then catching the backlight with the sun going down it was beautiful and then of course you got your leading lines going into this the storm which was really cool because that was the field so just a, that was an amazing storm here's a here's a better look at that storm Tulia, Texas wedge. You can see right in the middle of the shot, there's a single funnel. With that one single funnel, there's actually there's actually three or four multi-vortices dancing around that thing. If you look above it, like I was talking about those little white wispy clouds, that's actually your RFD being wrapped around that thing and being fed in that storm. If you look down closer to the surface, uh, look with the uh, wedge tornado, look to the right, you see these little wispy looking clouds, almost like serious clouds. That's your beaver's tail being pulled. That's your being. That's your feeder band, beaver's tail, whatever you want to call it. And it's being pulled into that storm, and it's helping increase that rotation. So, <clears throat> insane. This was a good shot because you can really see the beaver's tail. You can really start seeing the RFD starting to wrap. You can see the mezzo, no doubt. Full-fledged supercell with this. And you can definitely see how this thing is starting to spin. And it just look at the motion of the storm. You can really start seeing that real nice spin to it. This was, I would say, within five minutes after taking this, the tornado planted itself. <clears throat> this was my first real good chase of the year. And this was uh, Altus, Oklahoma. Uh, this was the fourth 4- oh, what was it? 4- dash, the third of April, I think, yeah, the 3rd of April. Um, and this train track, we stopped at a crossing, led right into the storm, and I was like, I've got to take it. You can see your updraft on the right. You got a little bit of mematis up towards the right, top right. You got a nice inflow tail if you follow the train track all the way down. You got a nice feeder band feeding into that storm, inflow they call it. And then your nice striated pancake stack supercell. One guy was like, that's a shelf. And I was like, that's no shelf. And then I showed him the panel, and he was like, oh, my God. <laughs> uh, this was Hollis as well. This was the Hollis Supercell. Same day before it, we got it at the tracks. This is what it looked like. Beautiful textbook Supercell. This is a panel. This was actually four st uh, shots stitched into one, so you can really get a good look at the full structure. Um, I love studying the dynamics of a supercell because I think they're fascinating. This was a surface-based storm. If you look at the base of the storm, a tornado could have came out of there at any time, but it was a little bit veered back, which the wind profile wasn't right for uh, tornadoes. So, And then if you look to the very far right, oh, you can see that huge feeder band bringing in that storm and rotating that, helping that thing really kick in that warm air. So... Oh, uh, yes, this was the Tulia, Texas supercell. Yes, looks like a shelf cloud, but it is a supercell because it was rotating and it dropped that big wedge tornado after. Uh, and then it dropped another one wrapped up in the rain. Um, if you look to your very far right down at the bottom, right below, if you look down at the bottom, you can kind of see a little bit of a wall cloud forming. You can see the bright greens in the storm. That's your hell falling. This was also another pano. I love doing panos because you can really get the full structure of these storms and to really show the pure beauty of what these things look like. Absolutely outstanding is what they are. Um, every storm's different. That's why I love photographing. Every supercell, every storm is totally different. Um, and like we go back before, we talked about the uh, pancake stack look. It kind of looks like a little pancake. So. <clears throat> 
All right, Billy. Oh, those are some great pictures. Uh, I've always been fascinated with your work. Uh, and I'll put his um, Facebook on this uh, show later. Get around to it. I appreciate you showing those, John. Oh, no problem. <clears throat> I appreciate all the hard work you do. Um, so it is a lot of work. <laughs> all that I don't doubt. Um, I. I, I, I photography a little bit, but not nearly as good as what you do. But um, let's get together and I'll teach you some things. Right, that, that sounds like a plan. Um, Donna, same to you. Thanks. <laughs> I will do that. What 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 made you um, so fascinated with photography and weather in general? Man, I tell you what, storm chasing for me. This is where it gets really kind of deep. Um, really kind of emotional at a, a, a aspect as well. Um, the anniversary was just a couple days ago. May 10th, 2008, we had a violent EF4 tornado go within a half mile of my home, my hometown. And I was living there. I was still in school. Um, May 10th, 2008. Um, it ended up killing my cousin. And it ended up killing one of my really good friends, uh, family friends and stuff. And uh, he was a firefighter for Seneca Protection District. And uh, I tell you what, I uh, I went home after those storms. Dad was like, man, it was hailing. I didn't know what was going on. He was getting baseball size hell. He goes, I don't know what's going on. Instead, you had an EF4 tornado just a half mile up the road. How do you not know? He goes, well, I wasn't really paying attention to the weather. I said, maybe we, we need to start paying attention more because that, that got a little close to comfort. Um, I was actually in Seneca, which is a couple more miles away from the Osho, and uh, I was sitting there at the at my grandmother's because it was Mother's Day weekend. We was all gathered around, and uh, we were kind of uh, going over things, and then the warnings came out. We started watching the weather, and I was like, I want to see this thing. So we kind of drove into town, and I just seen a big black mass, a real big black mass, and... Uh, it was the tornado. Couldn't really verify because it was rain wrap. You know, I couldn't really confirm that it was the tornado. But looking back, I know now that's what it was. And it was a big rain wrap mess. And I was like, man, that thing looks scary. That thing looks menacing. And people were freaking out and panicking. And people were just going crazy. And uh, which I totally understand that. But uh, I was like, man, these things are kind of fascinating. So what did I do? A couple weeks later, we had more severe storms. Me and my cousin got out, and then it kind of grew into an obsession and been chasing ever since. And uh, that's kind of the origin of it. And I actually read a book when I was a kid because when I was a kid, I was terrified of storms. Like, I had to cuddle up my dad when I had storms. Um, I hated them. Lightning scared the crap out of me. <laughs> Lightning scared the everlasting crap out of me. <laughs> um so dad's lap and dad let me sleep in bed was the best thing ever. And uh, the thing is, though, like, with my, uh, like, so many people will think it's kind of weird to say this. But for me, I don't fear these things anymore, but I respect them. And I think that's what we need to look at it. Like, everybody that studies meteorology, that everybody that chases, everybody that wants to forecast and stuff like that, we should never fear these things. Even people that's watching this tonight, you should never fear these things. You should get an understanding of what's going on. Because when you start to understand how the dynamics work and how the science works and how things have to be perfect for tornadoes to form, and I mean absolutely perfect, I mean, it, it makes you think because you can ask John, you can have, and Donna both, you can have the most textbook supercell in the world. Just like the one I showed you guys earlier, John showed. The Hollis, Oklahoma, that was a textbook supercell. Hands down, one of the best structures I've seen in years. And guess what? It didn't never produce. Did it try a couple of times? It struggled. It tried one good time. And that's, that's at its beginning stage. It really tried. Other than that, it did not try to produce. And that's the thing is you can have the most textbook storm and not produce. But if you can have an understanding of how this works and how things do have to be perfect, you can kind of get an understanding 
and be aware of what's going on instead of a fear. So like, that's really what got me into really wanting to chase is understanding forms and really being able to come back and show the people and the public how beautiful, how amazing, how textbook these storms are. And like I said before, you don't have to have fear, but you need to respect them. When there's a warning, take shelter. There's a warning for a reason. You know, same with the watch. There is a watch for a reason. Be prepared. Be ready. Get an understanding, you know. But that's my origin of wanting to chase is get an understanding of of all this. Because before, I couldn't tell you what a shelf cloud versus a supercell was. I thought they all were tornado producers. You know, I thought all storms produced tornadoes when I was younger. Now it's like, what is it? Like, I've got seven, eight tornadoes. I got eight tornadoes this year. And I tell you what, that's almost 10,000 miles worth of driving. <laughs> right, yeah. Another lovely part of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. And, uh, go ahead. Sorry, Billy. Oh, I'm, I'm just saying, like, just like, it's it's funny to look at because I look at my photos. I'm like, I'm not happy with my tornadoes because I got eight and 10,000 miles later, I've got eight tornadoes. I should have 50. You know, and it's like, no, there really hasn't been that yet. You know, season's just now starting to ramp up. And uh, it's just one of the things people don't understand the, the science of it, but that's okay. You know, with us, you guys can ask questions at what we're here for. You know, day or night, I get messages 24-7 on my phone. My phone goes off nonstop. <laughs> um, but the thing is, though, get an understanding, though, folks. You know, I recommend, and you can ask Donna and John both, don't just get out there and be like, I'm going to go chase a storm. Um, get an understanding of what you're facing first. Because when you're out there, you're going to really get like, oh, my God, this did not just happen. Um, there's a photo of me. I don't know if you could find it, John, or not. But there's a photo of me standing um, out in the field, and I'm holding up my arms in front of the storm. And... Uh, it really simplifies it all for you. We are so small compared to these monsters. You know, we are so small compared to these epic storms. And and that's really why I wanted to do it because face my fears, but also bring awareness, but also be able to produce some amazing photography that I can look back on and be really thankful that I was able to do this. Um, it's a humbling experience. It's a blessing, you know, I owe a lot of people thank you for letting me tag along with them and helping with them and teaching photography with them. And, you know, it's all about bringing that awareness to everything. You know, like I said before, never fear it, but have a respect for it. When there's a watch, when there's a warning, take those actions that's needed. So that's why I wanted to start it. Bring awareness to every all. <clears throat> um, Donna, do you have any questions? Uh, no, not really. Um, my interest kind of started out like Billy's, and um, you know, back in the seventies, I saw my first tornado, and I was terrified. And education, I learned that when something scares me, I learn about it. Um, so that way, I'm not yep. scared anymore. I used to be great at flying, and um, so what I do, I went to school to learn how to work on airplanes. So, uh, so now I know. See, I got in my first um, airplane the other day. And, I'm so um, terrified of heights. So, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, some of the, the technical uh, jargon, I guess, for lack of a better word, that, that Bill uses also is uh, people have questions about, because a lot of meteorologists use, you know, a lot of technical words, and uh, the, the average person doesn't know what they are. Um, and you can always look it up on the uh, uh, NWS website or something like that, and uh, or and you can ask us questions. But two of the ones, you know, he was talking about the mesos. Okay, that's that's going to be your rotation in the form. And he was talking um, RFD. Well, that's rear flank downdraft, and which is kind of where you want to be because that's at the back of the storm. So that means it's probably not going to come towards you at that point. Um, but you're going to get some crazy winds. <laughs> yeah, you're get some crazy winds, and you know. On days that it's going to storm, 
um, you know, and there might be a storm 20, 30, 40 miles away. And if it's a big one, you can stand outside and you can feel the breeze and you can feel it lift up. You know, you can feel the breeze go up and that's the air feeding into the storm. It's pretty, pretty amazing feeling. Um, but uh, I just want to say, you know, we're really, really grateful to have Billy aboard here and um, look for his experience to really help us out and help you guys out, you know, as the general public and, and uh, making everyone aware of uh, the storms and, and, you know, anything else that's going on and, and keep, uh, keep everybody informed on uh, what's going on, you know, and through photography and, and video and things like that. And, um, you know, we just, we think it's going to be a, a great deal. Hey, I Billy. really, I really appreciate it. Yes, hey, sir. Billy, look what I found. Yes, there it is. That right there, guys, that right there is something you guys need to take a really big grasp in because look how tiny I am compared to that beast behind me. There was actually a tornado wrapped up in the rain right behind me. And it was a pretty violent tornado. It did do some power line damage and stuff like that. Could have been a heck of a lot worse if the ingredients were a little bit or a little bit less. Um, that right there just goes to show you, though, guys, the really sheer magnitude of these things, how small we are versus something so monstrous. To me, it's just a, uh, it's very surreal. Each time you go out there, you can ask John and Donna both. When you're out there, that 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 surrealness is just unbelievable. You're you're taken to another world for a minute. Um, you're taken back to reality because you know these things can cause you know damage, death, destruction. But with the proper understanding, we can better inform. We can better aware. We can even with these images, you can look at these images and kind of tell what this thing is doing. Um, we was talking about inflow. If you look way off to the right, you can see a big, big, big beaver's tail coming into that thing. That beaver's tail was one of the most amazing features I've ever witnessed, and that was in Tulia, Texas as well. Um, that was one of the characteristics of this storm that was just off the chain. Um, and just incredible when you just take a look at it and really respect what, what this weather is doing because – Look at the major events that we've had here in Oklahoma. More, countless times. El Reno, you know, we've had some crazy, crazy incidences. We really dodged some bullets a couple weeks ago with that, you know, outbreak we had. A lot of things happened that day, and I'm really glad it happened the way it did because if we would have had a lot more clearing and a lot more sun, we would have had violent tornadoes all over the place. But... It just, I don't know. That's really all I got to say about that. Just just take a look at that for a minute, though, folks, and just really grasp how huge that thing is versus how small I am. And I'm a big boy. I'm a 200-pound guy. But, you know, I'm small compared to that beast behind me. So. <clears throat> all right. So I'm going to go ahead and let us wrap up because we've been on here about oh, almost 45 minutes. But... Um... If you guys have any questions, feel free to put them into the chat room. Uh, one of us three will get a hold of it and answer the question. Um, I appreciate Donna coming on tonight and Billy coming on tonight. Appreciate um, you having me. Yeah. Nice to meet you too, Donna. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry um, you couldn't see me, my stupid camera. <laughs> It, it happens. I, I wish my camera would not break or would would not work. But anyways, um, we appreciate everybody. Hey, you, want to, you want to do that new Snapchat filter and make you a woman? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had a team meeting on a messenger call or whatever it is. And it turns out you can do those kind of things to each other. And it was not yeah. very, it didn't accomplish much. <laughs> it was not very good meeting. It at all. <laughs> but anyways, we'll go ahead and let everybody go. Um, again, if you have any questions or anything after this uh, video ends, feel free to put it in the comments and we'll get a hold of it and answer it for you. We appreciate everybody joining us for today's show. Um, we'll be back next week for another episode. And until then, y'all take care and stay weather aware. <laughs>